Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week, South Sudan's biggest and most historic day yet is finally here. Sudan, the story behind the coverage of the referendum story. The media and the shootings in Arizona, the blame game on the U.S. airwaves, the complexities of reporting on the military-industrial complex, and a chase across multimedia platforms in our web video of the week. When the polls opened for Sudan's referendum on January 9th, it was the culmination of a democratic process designed to bring an end to a civil war that has lasted decades, killed an estimated one and a half million people, and led to accusations of genocide. For the Sudanese people, the stakes could not be higher, but the country's journalists found themselves under real pressure. And their work was colored by whether they were reporting from Khartoum in the north, Juba in the south, or Abeyi, the contested region in between. For the global media, the referendum was a chance to look at the country beyond Darfur, to provide more context to what has been a tragic story. Our starting point this week is Sudan, a country that has been long divided within itself, and a story that has polarized media both locally and around the world. Straight to Sudan, where the landmark independence referendum is being marked by strong voter turnout. Sudan is going through a very crucial stage. South and North most probably will separate. The choice on the ballot paper is between a solitary hand or two clasped together. Well, there is a media divide in Sudan. Those in the South are for secession and separation, while those in the North are advocating the government's position. We're asking whether the Sudanese will be better off with unity or partition. The referendum is so important because it is rewriting the history of Sudan. Anyone following the Sudan story from inside the country or outside should understand that doing journalism there is a complicated business. There is no way you can go outside Khartoum without getting a permit, not only from the Ministry of Information, but also from the security intelligence. And then when you come into the country, you have to get all these uh, permits and all these accreditations that you have to go through. And even when you get them, you have to be followed by a minder, particularly to the Darfur region and other parts of the country where there's a bit of instability. And you might as well go on a guided tour to Disneyland. And foreign journalists have it easy compared to what local reporters go through. Uh, many journalists, they are detained. Many journalists, they are accused uh, through the court. Um, I can say there is no uh, free freedom of speech. And if you want to wo work as a journalist in Sudan, you have to repeat what the government said. Otherwise, you are being in danger. Media tend to reflect the countries they cover, and Sudan, with its government-controlled north and separatist south, is no different. The difference between uh, the local reporting in the north, you have Sudan Durman television and you have some other uh, satellite television. They predominantly control either by the government or people actually link to the government. I've been watching the Sudan Sudanese television, and the line for the whole year is we all the news all the reports have to support unity and the south is totally different the south has a certain way of covering stories and a certain treatment they give which has a nationalistic outlook a narrow one because they are for secession and separation from the north and that's what they've been hammering through uh, for the uh, during this time of the referendum given that divide many sudanese turn to the international media for a less parochial perspective and while television matters in Sudan, like much of Africa, radio rules the airwaves. There are an estimated six million radios in the country, roughly six radios for every television. Mainly, they got most of their news from radio like the BBC Arabic, like uh, Monte Carlo, like the Voice of America. These are the type of radios which is people find more credible. And generally, few listeners actually listen to Sudanese. <laughs> One exception is Radio Dabanga, which does its journalism on the ground in Sudan, but is based in the Netherlands and broadcasts from beyond the reach of the Sudanese authorities. Because 
there's no chance to make a radio in South Sudan. Government, they think that media is very dangerous for them because through the media we tell the people the truth. We, do, we tell the people how they can, uh, they, they can solve their problems. We listen to the people. And government, they don't want that. That's the problem. Having a relatively free Sudanese news source operating from a safe distance has its advantages because most foreign news outlets are subject to their own biases on the Sudan story. The problems North and South are going to face. To a certain extent, the Western media sympathize with the fighters in Darfur. Within the Arab media, there's been some sympathy for uh, President Omar Hassan al-Bashir and his uh, National Congress party because they see that there's been an onslaught against al-Bashir. So there's some sort of sympathy with al-Bashir, who in the Arab world is seen as a, um, a brother. South Sudan's biggest... The global news media are still in Sudan in relatively large numbers. The question is, will they remain after the ballots are counted? And if so, what kind of story will be there for the telling? What I hope is that after the referendum took place, people are not going to forget about Sudan, that they remain focused on the humanitarian situation, the freedom of expression, because the real cause starts in a couple of weeks when they start separating, then the real focus should be on what is really going on with the people of Sudan. Here's what our Global Village Voices thought of the media coverage of the referendum in Sudan. Given the scale of the human catastrophe that has unfolded over the past 50 years in Sudan, it's very difficult for me to believe that we can say that as a journalistic world, we've covered this adequately. Celebrities have their place in bringing attention to causes, but they can only bring attention. They can't really direct advocacy. The coverage has been modest, um, as arguably one of the most significant political developments in Africa. It should have been more detailed and substantive. But one would also say that, you know, that's a function of uh, a number of factors, not least the fact that in the exercise, coincided with the Arizona shootings. Uh, it's always difficult for any story to compete with tragedy in, in the United States. South Sudan is getting increasingly enormous coverage in the international media. I don't want to undermine the role of observers and celebrities involved, but at the end of the day, the referendum will be over within one or two weeks. All of those people will go back home and the focus of journalists will be switched to another issues. Time now for Listening Post News Bites. That shooting spree in Arizona that left six Americans dead and U.S. Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords in critical condition has people arguing over the role, if any, the country's polarized media had in provoking the attack. The local sheriff certainly made his views known. The vitriolic rhetoric that we hear day in and day out from uh, people in the radio business and some people in the TV business Members of the left-wing media in the U.S. blamed the rhetoric of the right-wing Tea Party movement. And MSNBC's Keith Olbermann went further. He focused on Republican politician Sarah Palin, whose website symbolically targeted 20 Democrat members of Congress prior to the November election, putting them in crosshairs. If Sarah Palin does not repudiate her own part, however tangential, in amplifying violence and violent imagery in American politics, she must be dismissed from politics. Right-wing commentators mostly dismissed the accusations. They said their political opponents were simply using the tragedy to play politics. Ms. Palin's site, however, quickly took down the offending page. Anti-government protests in Tunisia that started in mid-December still haven't subsided, nor have government efforts to stop the media from covering them. Tunisians are protesting against soaring unemployment and poor living conditions. Initially, there wasn't much of an appetite for the story in the international media, and the country's state-controlled outlets largely ignored it. So Tunisians turned to the World Wide Web. Videos of rioting, clashes with police, and funerals of fallen protesters have all surfaced on social media sites like Facebook and YouTube. According to Nawat.org, an independent website run by Tunisian bloggers, the authorities started blocking access to those sites and hacking into the accounts of some of the activists posting the videos. 
There have been arrests made. Hamad Ben Amor, an activist rapper, was jailed after he posted this video, urging the president to deal with the country's problems. A Turkish court has sentenced a 24-year-old journalist to a 138-year jail term based on an anti-terror law that media watchdog organizations describe as abusive and insane. Amin Demir is the former editor of Azadiya Wellat, the country's only Kurdish newspaper. She was convicted for, quote, propaganda in support of Kurdish rebels and belonging to a terrorist organization, unquote. The charges relate to 84 articles that Demir wrote between 2008 and 2009 about the PKK, the banned Kurdish Workers' Party. She received 18 months in jail per article. The newspaper has been suspended a total of eight times by Turkish courts. At least nine of its journalists are in prison, including another former editor, Vedat Kursun, who was sentenced to 166 years in jail just eight months ago. Turkey has applied for membership to the European Union, but EU leaders who oppose its application frequently cite the country's poor record on freedom of the press as a reason to lock it out of the EU. Backers of Julian Assange have learned that the U.S. government is not just investigating the WikiLeaks frontman, it's also investigating them. The U.S. Justice Department has got a court order asking that Twitter hands over all of the information it has on users with ties to Assange. Those include Bradley Manning, the U.S. soldier who allegedly leaked information to Assange, Dutch hacker Rob Gongrip, WikiLeaks volunteer Jacob Applebaum, and freedom of information activist and member of the Icelandic parliament, Birgitta Jonsdottir. We interviewed Ms. Jonsdottir last year. She's done a lot of work with Assange, including on the release of the video footage in April last year that showed some indiscriminate killings of Iraqis in Baghdad in 2007. That's probably what landed her on the U.S. Justice Department's radar. She tweeted on the subject, USA government wants to know about all my tweets and more since November 1st, 2009. Do they realize I am a member of parliament in Iceland? The answer to that, Ms. Jan's daughter, is probably, the better question might be, do they care? We're back after the break with a report about the defense industry and the journalists who cover it. Welcome back. The defense industry is very large, complex, and secretive. It's a challenging topic for any journalist. As a result, many in the media tend to report on the global arms trade as a business story. Fighter jets, nuclear subs, and ballistic missiles all boil down to dollars and cents, and in many cases, jobs created. For those who want to dig a little deeper, though, there is a raft of trade publications offering detailed information on every weapon system out there and the companies that manufacture them. That level of insider knowledge makes the writers and editors of trade publications popular with other news organizations that are looking for an expert to help explain big arms deals. But are those defense specialists too close to the industry they cover to provide critical analysis, insight that the public needs into how the buying and selling of military goods affects them? The Listening Post's Jason Mohica now on the conflicted world of defense journalism. <laughs> Welcome to Euro Naval, a military trade show in Paris that some in the industry jokingly call Naval Fashion Week. Everybody from every navy in the world come to see what's new, what's up, what's next. Raphael de Subercaz is a journalist who writes for TTU, a small independent publication that covers defense issues. When it comes to the defense industry's trade publications, there's plenty of competition. This girl with pink hat uh, work for uh, Mer et Marine, which is a naval newspaper, not only military. You have one feat in military affair and the other in the civilian and uh, gray business. So some, it's bizarre. It's weird. And there are plenty of other defense publications from around the world camped out here. It's an ideal networking opportunity because the people they write about are the same people they write for. We've been going 30 years. We have built up a database of key military and industry professionals. Some of these publications are startups. Others have been around for more than a century. James is, is uh, really famous when you have journalists looking for details on military affairs. Most of them go to James. From their London office, the James Information Group provides its customers with an obsessive level of facts, figures, and analysis on all things military. You can also retrieve critical information 
about an unfamiliar warship that's entering your area? Well, we have uh, specialists covering all aspects of uh, military hardware uh, and also military geopolitics. A guy can walk into a defence exhibition, one of our editors, look at a piece of equipment, spot an additional an antenna even, and know that there is a new system. And it's that degree of knowledge that, that really sets us apart. Let's kick the story around. Anna Gilmore is a senior analyst for the Americas at IHS Janes, and she joins us now. Janes has been in business since 1898 and has developed a sterling reputation and a vast network of insider sources. Sources are extremely important and um, one thing that I, I like to think sets apart our reporting is the degree of trust that we can have with a number of our sources, both with industry uh, and within the military. That degree of trust is helpful if you're looking to find out how enhanced electronic sentinels bring improved precision to the battlefield. But if you're looking for a better understanding of how this multi-billion dollar industry affects governments and politics, then you'd best look elsewhere. While these reporters are extraordinarily well sourced, you know, they often don't look at these issues the way, uh, say, an investigative reporter would look at these things or, or just a reporter from a mainstream paper would. The problem with trade publications is that they don't want to piss on their patch. Basically, they're often reliant on the industry that they're covering for the advertising. They talk to these people each day. They don't want to upset them. If you had a news story on the TV about the arms trade with Saudi Arabia, they're good to tell you how many planes there are in this package, what the value is, and that type of thing. But you won't get any ethics from them. The ethics of the arms trade are left to papers like The Guardian and investigative reporters like Rob Evans and David Lee, who conducted a multi-year investigation into British defense firm BAE. The story detailed how BAE bribed Saudi royalty to pull off the biggest arms deal in history. What I'm trying to tell you is, so what? We did not invent corruption. Not the kind of story you'd find in the trade magazines. It's a massive corrupt deal involving countries and foreign policy. And, you know, Jane's Defense Weekly is, is, is just not looking for those kinds of stories, even though their reporters are extraordinarily well sourced and may have even, you know, dealt with many of the players involved and may even know about some of this stuff going on. Arms manufacturers don't just influence trade journals. In France, one of them is a major media player. Dassault bought France's oldest paper, Le Figaro, in 2004, and now wants to buy the country's biggest daily, Le Parisien. Dassault's expansion into media may have blown a multi-billion dollar deal to sell fighter planes to the United Arab Emirates. Last year, Le Figaro reported that the UAE was using taboo Israeli technology to defend its borders. The UAE put the deal with Dassault on ice. In spite of this, Dassault still has its eyes on more papers. If it succeeds, it would mean that a large percentage of the French press would be owned by a company whose primary business is selling fighter jets. It's a game we mix trade and diplomacy. You're not just in business. You're in diplomacy, you're in international affairs. I mean, this is business at the end of the day, sure, uh, isn't it? Absolutely. The arms deal creates hundreds of thousands hmm. of jobs in the arms industry in the next 20 years. A lot of the reporting in the main street media about arms deals are, is about jobs. Britain and the Saudis have signed this deal and it's worth X amount and it will provide X thousands of jobs. It is one of the biggest deals of its kind and it's part of an... When the mainstream media portrays defense industry stories in either the business context or usually in a pretty simplistic foreign policy context. It's often leaving out the, the, the why this matters to people uh, uh, aspect of the story. So why does this matter? Because virtually every nation on earth is either on the manufacturing side or the receiving end of the arms trade. And that's too big a patch to leave to the trade magazines. More Global Village Voices now on the arms industry and those that report on them. Most mainstream news organizations don't cover the arms trade at all. And when they do, it's in a very shallow way. For instance, last year, U.S. President Barack Obama announced a $60 billion arms deal with Saudi Arabia. 
Most news organizations covered this as a one-day story, even though it was the, probably the biggest arms deal in world history, and very few reporters asked whether it was a good idea in the first place. Part of the problem is reporters rely on defense industry publications for sources and story ideas. Those defense industry journals wouldn't exist without advertising dollars from the weapons manufacturers. And so there's a great need for more independent reporting on the arms trade and the defense industry. Even if France is a major defense exporter, there is no special treatment of weapon sales by mainstream, uh, mainstream French media. Indeed, those topics are treated the same way as other major export contracts. Mainly, French defense companies avoid to communicate before uh, a contract is signed. Of course, journalists want to know uh, what uh, happened during the negotiations, but again, there is no specific approach for different sales issues. Finally, here's a novel way to publicize a new piece of computer hardware. Intel wanted to show off the performance capabilities of its new i5 processor. So it went to a California studio called Venables Bell & Partners, and they came up with a film that illustrates what the new chip makes possible. It's a mini chase movie with the heroine moving through all kinds of digital platforms like Facebook, YouTube, iTunes, even Google Earth. The result is kind of like the born identity for the geek generation. It's perfect for our web video of the week. We'll see you next time at The Listening Post.